Just in case something wonky happens, I like to have a backup recording. So Nancy, you let me know when you'd like me to take us live, okay? Sure. Okay. Do we have everybody in from the waiting room then? Okay, so then let's go ahead and go live, Katie, okay? All right, you're good to go, Nancy. Okay. Um, Katie, thank you so very much. Um, welcome, everybody, to Northwest Indiana Green Drinks. And um, this year is our 12th year. We're very excited to have him been bringing these programs to our community for 11 years now. And they've gone as far as Canada, California, and Florida. So we do reach quite a large audience. Um, this evening, we're very um, blessed to have um, three of my really good friends with me. And uh, before I forget, I do want to acknowledge those organizations who are sponsors ongoingly of Green Drinks. And that would be Save the Dunes, Michigan City Sustainability Commission, and of course, 219 Green Connect. And then today's hosts are um, WIMS um, 1420 Radio in Michigan City and also In Nature. And In Nature has a Facebook page. It has a website and it has a Facebook group. So it's very special because of that. So I'm um, Katie, um, I'm gonna hand this over to you then for some housekeeping items. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, welcome everyone. Glad to have you with us either on Zoom or Facebook, or perhaps you're watching the recording later. Um, if you are on Zoom with us, you are muted, um, just to keep down some background noise, just FYI on that. If you have any questions throughout the course of the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat on Zoom or in the comments or questions in uh, on Facebook Live, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of today's presentation. Um, this presentation is being recorded, and so the recorded versions will live on the Save the Dunes Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. Um, we share out the links directly for these recordings every month in our e-newsletter, so I'd encourage you to sign up. I will drop the link to get signed up for our newsletter in the chat and comments. Um, but I think that that's about it. We just encourage you to share the recordings. It's an important message today, so share it as far as we can. Nancy. Thank you very much, Katie. And I do want to make just one announcement. We had a phenomenally huge victory down in Indianapolis today at the state capitol. We were able to kill the amendment um, that was on Bill um, 1329, House Bill 1329. And it really was a group effort of a lot of people from all places and spaces in Indiana. This was the really bad um, bill that would have changed the name of um, PFASs to something we never would have recognized and was going to give them protection forever within the state of Indiana. Indiana would have been the first and only state to have passed a bill like this. So um, thank you to all of you that took part in our um, efforts this week to be sure that that didn't happen. And I'm going to hand this over to my very dear friend, um, Kathy Sippel, who's going to introduce my other dear friends, um, Steve Sass and Amanda Smith. So, Kathy, it's yours. Take it away, please. Thank you so much, Nancy. I just love how all the, the, the threads of this uh, project and the arc of uh, this region's embracing native plants and pollinator gardens has just expanded and really uh, Northwest Indiana Green Drinks has been pivotal to, to gather us and share expertise here in our region. And I wanna say these speakers that we have today, um, they are very well known. I am in the Pollinator Project training right now, which is an international training. And may I just say that uh, Steve Sass and Amanda Smith were the presenters for a worldwide audience that I just found out was actually represented on six continents, all continents except Antarctica last week. So they are experts, not only here in Indiana, but well, well beyond. So we are so, so lucky to have them. And I know they've got a lot of great information um, about Pollinator Gardening 101 that uh, is gonna give you a really great basis for learning. 
And then we'll have a little bit of time at the end where I'll come back in and share, you know, how to take this kind of more global message and big idea into some ways that you can take action and get connected here locally. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve and Amanda and let you all introduce yourselves with a better bio than I can do, but just know that I'm one of your biggest fans and very, very grateful to have you here tonight. Gotcha. Thank you, Kathy. That's I'm so kind. I'm not worthy. <laughs> we're we're really super happy to be here and proud to be here. And I've it's been a while since I've um, presented for Green Drinks, and this is Amanda's first time, so this is this is kind of a special time for us too. So I will um, turn on my screen share here. And there we go. Hopefully, you should see that coming up. So, um, anyway, as far as bios go, Amanda, you want to go on that one? I can start. <laughs> um, I am coming to you actually not from northern Indiana, but from central Indiana, um, the Hamilton County area, where I work as a uh, in the parks department for Hamilton County Parks, and have done that for many years. And uh, teamed up with Steve a few years ago now um, to expand. Um, ecological information and education and um and really broaden our, our you know the reach that that i felt like needed to happen when we started this initiative we, which we call i in nature or in nature back in uh, 2016 i guess it was and eventually we, uh, we incorporated into indiana nature llc and uh, but our primary focus of of in of in nature is ecological education and trying to um Get people to better understand the world around us so that they will better steward it and better take care of it. So we'll, we're going to jump right in because we're going to have quite a few slides to get through. I'll turn it over to Amanda to kick us off. Um, well, we um, don't hear about um, nature as much in mainstream media as we should. I know even since I was a kid, um, global warming and the ozone and all these different issues have been uh, part of you know, occasionally we'll hear news of them, but um, I was watching television recently and C CNN ran a report, um, you know, on CNN, on the real television, which kind of shocked me about um, species decline and um, in looking at essentially what the what the information was, there was a uh, the UN um, recently published a report by let me get this right the conservation of migratory species of wild animals, and found that of the eleven uh, well about twelve hundred species um, that they have deemed migratory, one out of five of those is um, is now threatened. So we're seeing. We're seeing a big decline um, in biodiversity, and um, or at least we're on the cusp of a really frightening um, extinction potentially. And we've heard of the sixth extinction come up before, but um, the news is is becoming increasingly grim uh, related to um, species, especially migratory uh, species, which some pollinators fall into. And. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is we, we seem to have more and more people, uh, particularly young people who are concerned about the climate crisis. And um, I'm, I like to remind folks that we have, we're facing two existential crises, which is the, not only the climate crisis, but also the extinction crisis, the bio slash biodiversity crisis. We're losing species at um, a rapid rate on earth. And at some point, um, our own lives will, will depend on that. We've, we've maybe have heard the um, analogy of the airplane that loses its rivets. And at some point it all falls apart. But um, this interesting article from the New York times, where they talk about how um, the, the green groups have almost replaced um, climate. The climate has kind of replaced the urgency with a lot of green groups, whereas it used to be people uh, that were more concerned about nature. So uh, we just have to remember that we have both of these crises that are taking place right now that we have to uh, address. Um, so this program, we're concentrating on pollinators and um, pollinators, we thought we'd do a little bit of background about what exactly a pollinator is and where they came from. And um, the pollinators, the pollinating insects in particular, arrived on Earth around the same time as the angiosperms, the flowering plants did uh, in the early Cretaceous period. And um, it's a mutualistic relationship that's developed between the pollinators and the things that they pollinate. So for example, the, the plants need the pollinators to be able to transport their pollen for reproduction. And in many cases, the animals, um, insects and other animals um, 
particularly also bats and some mammals will also have a benefit from the, the pollination. Um, so on the right hand side of the of the, um, the screen here, we, we see some of the major groups of the pollinators. And naturally, first off, we think of the uh, the hymenopter, which consists of the bees and the um, the wasps as the, the major pollinators. And it's true that they are, but we also have another uh, a number of other insect pollinators that maybe get um, not quite the um, the press that the bees do, which include the the flies. A lot of flies are pollinators, and as well as beetles, um, true bugs. Uh, maybe you've seen the the milkweed bugs on your milkweed plants; they're pollinators. And then, of of course, also the lepidoptera, which are the butterflies and moths, which are um, an order of insects that we've kind of specialized in over the past few years. Um, and here's a closer look at how angiosperm reproduction takes place. So up at the top of the screen, we have the male organ, which is called the stamen. At the tip of the stamen, we have the anther, which is producing um, the microspores, which we also know as pollen. And um, for pollination to take place, the microspores have to travel from the anther on the stamen um, to the pistil, which is the female organ on the female flower. In this case, um, we have uh, an ovary, and the tip of the ovary is the style, which is the receptor uh, for the, the pollen, the microspore. And the, um, the female uh, organs produce what are called megaspores. And up until the angiosperms came out on Earth, pollination was done either by water uh, or later by wind. Um, if you think of the conifers, the gymnosperms were, were pollinated by wind. And we still have angiosperms that are uh, pollinated by wind also, namely like the grasses and the plants that don't have showy flowers like ragweed are wind pollinated. But uh, it's estimated that 75 to 80 percent of the flowering plants rely on pollinators for pollination as part of their life cycle. So it's obviously really important important that we keep them around. Um, and pollinators have really needs just like any other organisms do on earth, um, a source for pollen or nectar, places to, to nest and to shelter and to overwinter, to hide from predators, um, obviously water. And then when we get into the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths, uh, host plants are also critical. So when we talk about pollinators, we usually think about the um, the pollinator plants or the, the nectar plants. But um, as far as Lepidoptera go, when they're in their larvae stage, larval stage, which would be the caterpillars, uh, the caterpillars eat from a variety of different leaves and um, they can be very specialized. So all of this adds together into the suitable habitat. So this is what we need to be able to have if we want to keep the insects around, if that makes sense. Um, a little bit farther on, on host plants. So we talked about, um, everybody's familiar with the relationship of the monarch caterpillar and the milkweed butterfly, uh, or excuse me, the milkweed plant. And um, the truth is that most Lepidoptera are specialists to some degree. So in, the, in this particular slide, in the bottom center, we have the caterpillar. It's an early instar caterpillar of the butterfly that we have on the right, which is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And it can eat from a a fair a number of different species of plants. One of the things that it can eat from is the uh, the plant that we see on the left, which is the the black cherry tree, um, Pernoceratina, which has a a chemical inside of it that, when eaten by a mammal, converts over to hydrogen cyanide and is very toxic. So. Um, if we were to try to eat the black cherry, it would make us sick. If we ate enough of it, it would make us very sick. But these specialist insects have been able to circumvent the toxins that are built into these plants and be able to not only utilize them, but in some cases, um, thrive from them. So I just wanted to point out, this is we're not going to really talk very much about host plants on this program, but they're extremely important for Lepidoptera. So when we talk about gardening, we need to remember that we have to have the host plants around or the nectar plants aren't going to do us any good, if that makes sense. If I could add real fast too, I think pollinators does tend to, to focus on showy plants that provide um, either pollen, uh, but in most cases, nectar. Um, and uh, But we oftentimes forget for um, a more complete ecosystem, certainly having a layered approach um, with trees and shrubs is very helpful. Trees and shrubs are uh, by and large one of the the bigger groups of plants or types of plants that uh, host the largest amount of Lepidoptera for the most part. There's exceptions, of course, milkweed and others, but um, many things feed off of trees and shrubs. 
in vines too, right? Poison mm -hmm. ivy is actually an important host plant for a number of native insects. So, um, but then we also have the non-pollinators. So we, we couldn't really just go into this program talking about strictly pollinators because they're, um, although they are critical, so are the non-pollinators and we need to garden for them too. We need to landscape for them as well. And um, these are some of the benefits that they, um, they provide for us. So decomposition and nutrient cycling. Um, think about um, some of the, the beetles that eat um, carrion and dead animals, right? That's a way that they're providing ecosystem services. Um, predation, we see up at the top left, a cicada killer wasp, which is its duty in the ecosystem is to make sure we don't have too many cicadas. Um, water filtration, um, caddis flies in particular will, will aid in um, water filtration. And um, seed dispersal, we put this in. Uh, the, the bloodroot plant on the, the bottom right, which is one of our spring ephemerals will be flowering here in a few weeks, uh, its seeds are, are spread by ants. So we depend on ants for this service. And uh, let's see, I, I skipped by one. Oh, the role in the food web. Um, if you look at the top right image, that's a chipping sparrow. And of course, it has a caterpillar in its mouth. And most of our terrestrial birds feed their babies from these caterpillars. So they're, they're extremely important to have um, in the ecosystem. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Amanda, before we go to this next slide? No, okay. So it's all about habitat, right? And we think about habitat decline when we hear about, um, we're losing the habitat left and right and things are going extinct. I think we typically, we typically think that that's happening in the Amazon rainforest or in Borneo or places like that. But in actuality, it's happening all around us, right? It's happening here in Northern Indiana and Southwestern Michigan. Uh, to illustrate that, this is a, a Google Earth image, satellite image of a woods in Eastern St. Joseph County in April 1998. And this looks like, a, you, know, you can't really tell for sure, there's some disturbances to it, but it looks like it's a fairly intact wood woods that's um, habitat for animals that in plants that are part of our ecosystem and they're providing these ecosystem services um, this is the same woods fast forward in april 2023 and this is really typical i think we've all seen this right we got we probably all have these experiences in our in our lifetimes where we look at these properties that we remember the, the woods that used to be back here and it's now this subdivision and what have we done we've replaced this woods largely with plants that our native insects cannot use. If we look at that little um, subdivision there with the circle in it, we see a lot of lawn. And I bet if we were to zoom in closer, we would see a lot of exotic trees and a lot of other plants that our native um, pollinator insects and lepidopter and other insects didn't co-evolve with. And um, this is another closer look at that um, that habitat where, you know, this is what the woods look like. It looks like it was a pretty decent woods. There's some may apple growing beneath there and a lot of native trees. Um, but typically what happens is we just come in, um, you know, like this with a bulldozer and just scrape everything and throw everything away. And we don't think about saving these parts. We don't think about the animals that live there that we need for survival, right? This is an after photo. This is the entrance of that particular subdivision. And um, I went, I took a took this picture and looked at the plants closer to see what they were replacing it with, and it's um, it's largely plants that are that are exotic to North America, not even just to Indiana, and again that our our native insects are not being able to use. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to land trusts because, really, first and foremost, we need to protect habitat. Um, so we're we're gonna. We're going to get into the gardening element here and in, in like just another slide, but I want, to, I want to make sure that we remember how, the importance of keeping what took thousands of years to construct. We can't, um, we can't put things back after we've destroyed them, not the way that they were. It may look kind of the same, but it's not the same. So uh, shout out to the Indiana Land Trust. Uh, Save the Dunes, of course, is, is uh, in that group that uh, protects land for perpetuity. Um, and there's other programs such as the classified forest program that Indiana has. It gives tax breaks for people to be able to preserve habitat. And then to a lesser degree, I think we have like city parks and county parks that are, um, that are pr protecting habitat to a degree, but they also have a recreational element to them. So it's not quite on the same power as maybe what a land trust would do. Um, and that really kind of brings us to the idea of, of restoration versus what we call recreation. So uh, we hear a lot of uh, talk um, uh, or a lot of terminology thrown around about 
a restored prairie. Um, in many cases, they were planted in areas that were never prairie to begin with. So I don't, I don't like that term because I don't think we can really restore things that we've destroyed. We can recreate things to certain to a certain degree. Um, this is a couple examples of that. This is a, on the left. This is a a park property in in South Bend along the St. Joe River. That's my my daughter Lindsay is cutting um, um, invasive vines, winter creeper vines off the trees. And then on the from the right hand side we have a, a school also in South Bend that we planted this uh, pollinator garden at about ten years ago. Um, so we're going to talk about our process and um, we've our process of creating habitat or refining um, or restoring habitat is something that we we both um, being in the ecology business for a number of years have um, have sort of honed. And this is the first time we've really ever been able to share um, kind of the steps that we recommend that you do and anybody can do uh, to better steward the properties that you that you own or that you manage so amanda i'm doing all the talking you should that's talk okay right keep now. going for a bit okay so the first step is to assess what we have and i think it's important for us to know that these that um, what we're talking about i think can be scaled um, almost inf infinitely like uh, for example i didn't want to we didn't want to put together a program that was only geared towards people that had um, 50 by 50 uh, backyards in a, in a city lot or something like that. Maybe you've got a lot of acreage. Maybe you don't have a lot of acreage. But in either case, the first step that you should do in stewarding your property is to figure out what you have, what's there, right? Make a, make a plant inventory. And there's different uh, folks that can help you with this. A lot of people use uh, the apps nowadays, and which are good to a degree. Um, you shouldn't always depend on them. We've seen them be dreadfully wrong and sometimes and result in unfortunate consequences, but uh, that's one tool. We have a lot of uh, technological tools, which we'll talk about that are out there that we can utilize. So taking care of um, uh, or creating a, a plant inventory, uh, an assessment of the property that you have is always like the, the perfect first step. Um, the slide that you see here is a, an inventory that we did on a, on a South Bend Park property. And you can kind of see the some of the things that we we included in there, the taxonomic name and the the um, the common name, what family it's from, the conservation value, and whether or not it was native, and from there we can kind of we, we can get a good um, description, a good feel for the quality of the property that we're we're taking care of. In many cases, too, if we go back to one, um, when I'm working with local homeowners um, as to where to start. Um, getting that inventory, finding out what's native in your yard, um, what's you know native to your your ecosystem, which we're going to talk about, um, and then one of the first steps is sort of assessing kind of the the value of those plants, which can be done with the C value, um, which we could talk more answer questions about, but also just looking at whether or not it's invasive. So I typically let people know invasive species should be the very first thing that are removed. So identifying those first and removing those and then replace with the native species. But then outside of invasive species, you have species that are non-native, maybe not uh, known invasive, not, uh, but some are in varying levels of naturalizing other areas. So I, I try to kind of prioritize my hit list um, in my own yard. Also the tools that you have, if you use a field guide and you're old school like I am, um, in many cases, you can't find most of the the nursery trees in our field guides because these are not native trees. Um, so that that's where sometimes the apps are very helpful. Okay. Um, it's also really important to know the limitations if you're planning to do a, a new garden in particularly. Most cities in Indiana, and we did a study um, on this a, a couple of years ago with an, with an intern that worked for us, but um, most cities in Indiana have some sort of a vegetation ordinance. Many of them are quite bad. Um, some of them are pretty decent, but I would say the, the majority of them are outdated and archaic, um, but they're still on the books. So if you're planning, for example, if you're planning to put in a, a native prairie garden um, with plants that may, grasses and forbs that may grow to six or seven feet tall, um, make sure you're familiar with your, your local codes. Uh, and, and typically these are not were never written for um, to punish people like us. They were more for people that just flat out stop taking care of their property. But 
um, they can be misinterpreted by code enforcement people. So the the uh, the slide on the right, um, the lady on the right is um, is Kathy Cummings. I, I met a few years ago. She was uh, she lives in Chicago. She's a retired school teacher, and uh, she received the, the mayor's award for the her native landscape that she has in um, in her city lot in Chicago. And a, a month or two later, she got a um, received a six hundred dollar citation from the city for for having weeds. Um, which she eventually uh, won by taking him to court, but it was you know, it was a battle, and nobody wants to do that. So it's just important and, to to keep that um, in mind. Most of those those citations come from reports from neighbors. So somebody that um, doesn't like you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, typically, in. the squeaky wheel, you know, gets the oil, and in this case, or gets the attention from from folks. But in many cases, we found that in our studies. Um, Certain plants, like even milkweed, um, common milkweed in particular, are still listed in many of the local ordinances as uh, as a plant that is not allowed. Or um, some are becoming a little bit more progressive and updating their ordinances, but many of them were written for farming um, communities um, during you know 50, 60, 70 years ago. And another step in assessing is um, to have a feel for your timeline, your expectations, and your budget. So this particular uh, screenshot is of a fire station that um, we are, Amanda and I are involved in, in working with. Um, it was built on an oak savanna in the back of the, this is in South Bend, uh, or St. Joe County. Um, in the back of the photo, you can see some remnant savanna, and the front of the property was an area that was scraped uh, due to the construction process, and they put in a little exercise trail for the firefighters. Um, but we're restoring it back to what the native savanna is, but it's to, we want it ideally to look like what's in the back there. But it's going to take a while, so we need to make sure that we have um, we recognize our expectations. Um, native plant gardens typically take a number of years to mature to the point where they look good, and um, it, it's helpful if we are, we're aware of that. Um, in, in research on some of the projects that we're involved with, we do we've done a tremendous amount of research. The um, the property in the um, in the blue and yellow in the bottom center there is a um, a park in in Granger, Indiana that we're involved with, and the green area is a historic prairie that used to exist there that is now extinct. Uh, but we're trying to kind of recreate some of the habitat that used to be at that prairie um, for posterity. The little red or uh, red dots that you see running up and down the streets are the um, the original land survey points, so which are actually still available. If you're really you know really into this, if you're doing a, a restoration project, and you want to try and be as accurate accurate as possible. You can actually find like the 1829 land surveys with the um, uh, National Archive. Um, so which is what we did. And this is an example of one. We can see where this little uh, red dot is at. The surveyors noted uh, that there was a bur oak that was 30 inches in diameter that was there. You have to um, be really good at reading old cursive though, right? Yeah, yeah, we did get really good at that. <laughs> um, so when researching this, and I can't remember what we were, oh yeah, I don't know what we were gonna do, we were gonna talk about. So we wanted to recreate that oak savanna, um, but we weren't really sure we didn't necessarily have all the plant records there. So, you know, walking into this nearby remnant area, we're, which is right behind, this is the woods that's behind the fire station there, we we're able to find some native remnant plants. So the way that this kind of pertains to you maybe is that there are a lot of remnant um, properties in Northwest Indiana that you can visit. Um, this is uh, another remnant property in that same uh, geological system. This is Elbel Park in South Bend. And I brought this up because this was one of the um, uh, a situation where the, the golf course was, was thinking about adding um, some native plants that were maybe native to the county but weren't native to that particular site but this is a really a remnant property and um i kind of advised against the idea of of introducing anything new to that um because it really is truly a, a gem and so there, here's some other examples of some remnant properties that we would have in northwest indiana we have beach maple forest and and black oak savannah we have tall grass prairie so if the advice that we're trying to come get through here is that if you're trying to do um, an ecosystem garden or habitat or restoration, there are places around that you can visit to get a feel for what the plant communities are like and um, what the ecosystems look like. And it's also really, I think, helpful to maybe visit other gardens. 
And uh, I know there's a number of, um, uh, Kathy uh, mentioned she was involved with the Master Gardeners group. I know there's Master Gardeners that, that are on the call here that I think Master Gardeners do like yard tours. The Wild Ones Native Plant Group over in Gibson Woods um, also has yard um, tours and Shirley Hines Land Trust has a native plant uh, award called Bringing Nature Home. So if you have uh, the opportunity be, to be able to do any of these garden tours, you can draw some inspiration perhaps from them. Um, and step, our step three on, in this process is planning. So planning, when we talk about the age of the plant material. So the, cheaper, the cheapest way that you can do a pollinator garden would be to purchase seed. Uh, but it's also going to take the longest time to do. So you could, you may want to consider mixing seed with plugs or gallon plants or even larger plants. Um, you have to plan the timing of all of this. You don't want to be stuck in a situation where you're planning, you're planting in July, for example. If you have turf grass, you're going to need to allow time for killing off the turf grass, perhaps uh, soil amendments. And um, if you have the, if you're into technology, there's a lot of uh, really cool technology that um, that you can utilize, such as this um, this GIS map that we use for doing some tree planting. And also, you need to account for weeding and watering. The worst thing you can do is is to kill off an acre of lawn and then seed it with stuff, and then go, oh no, you know, I, I don't know if I can handle taking care of all of this. So start small. Um, this is a, just a slide of us going over at that at the fire station I talked about working with the general contractors uh, to let them know, keeping everybody on pace with what's going on, every, keeping everybody on the same page. Education. Talk about education, Amanda. I feel like I'm um, dominating the conversation. No, here. it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Education um, will be critical when you're, especially if you're working within, um, you know, kind of the confines of an, a typical neighborhood, an HOA, um, you will probably want to uh, make sure your neighbors are on board with, with what you're doing. Um, and that is, is more than just, hey, by the way, I'm going to, you know, have some taller plants maybe um, at the house, but um, helping them understand the benefit of it. And um, you can work through social media channels. I think a lot of neighborhoods nowadays certainly have like a Facebook page. There's, um, there is the um, next door, is that what it's called? Uh, so different apps that you can do to inform uh, neighbors and um, take, you know, hopefully maybe touch other people with it. But it's amazing. I had an interaction with a neighbor years ago who was from New York originally and uh, said, you know, I just don't get it. I'm out here every day, you know, weeding my plants, but you you barely are out here and, and your plants don't look terrible, which was a compliment, I guess, from her. And um, so, you know, at that point, I had a pretty mature, um, you know, native prairie uh, landscapes or not prairie, but native plant landscape. And um, so there was an educational opportunity involved in that. Um, and there's certainly a lot of canned um, infographics. We try to do that through our Facebook group and page as well, but certainly ways um, if if you're not as articulate or, or even um, as studied about the topic, there's more and more every year great resources um, to kind of get the word out and to help educate. Um, and a sign can really go a long way um, in helping to um, helping people to understand what you're doing. Um, in many cases, sometimes if you don't, um, if you're, if you let things kind of go in most uh, people's minds, they may actually be concerned for your welfare, but a sign can actually go a long way to help people understand uh, what, what the aim is. Yeah, this was uh, that garden that I showed earlier in this in the um, presentation here of the kids planting at the school. This was um, back on back to school night. Uh, the teachers um, took all the photographs that I made of the garden that we installed and put it right at the entrance of the school just to let people know, let the parents know, let the administrators know this is what we're doing. It's intentional. We're taking care of it. We're not just neglecting it. Um, and then step five, it comes time for implementation, right? This is the fun part. So hopefully by this point, you've got your plan in place. You know exactly the plants that you're dealing with, where they're approximately where they're going to go. This is the fire station again, where we've laid out the, uh, the gallon pots. These are all native plants, our mulch is ready. 
Um, rain <laughs> is, is miserable sometimes to work in, but it's great planting weather. And that's my daughter again, um, planting, uh, transplanting a, a prairie plant um, on a project that we were working on. So, uh, but, you know, in this case, we weren't able to time things very good with the, with the fire station where we actually put these plants in in August, which early August, which is a terrible time, um, except if you're working with a fire station, uh, lo and behold, they have water, um, big water supplies around. So this is how we watered the plants, which is pretty cool from this pumper truck. Um, and um, the, the slide on the right-hand side is one of the, the firefighters who um, took the time to ask me about the plants and he wanted to know he's out there with a flashlight trying to identify little saplings. So it was really a nice kind of a feel-good story that they really got into understanding that. Um, that brings us to step six of seven, which is manage and maintain. The worst thing you can do is seed something or plant something and walk away. Native plant gardens often get billed as being maintenance free. They're not, uh, particularly early on. This is a park in South Bend that's right downtown that you can see is completely overrun with uh, Canada thistle. And this was a native prairie um, restoration. In fact, that sign that we showed um, a few slides back, the uh, this one on the left hand side, that was a, that was um, where it was planted at. Um, here's a rain garden that was planted around the same time and not kept up with weeding. And we can see there's mare's tail and, and ragweed and a bunch of undesirable plants and it looks junky and people get upset about that. Um, this slide is kind of interesting. These are the, these are all invasive plants except for the one on the top left, which is Kentucky bluegrass. So left or right is Kentucky bluegrass, spotted knapweed, Canada thistle, crown vetch, uh, mugwort, purple loosestrife, bull thistle, and then poison hemlock at the bottom. And the other thing that all of these plants have in common is that I photographed all of these at prairie restorations. So these are clearly examples of just uh, poor management and maintenance plans going in and moving forward. And we also have to look out for um, some of the native stuff that's um, more inventive that's going to come in that um, will take advantage of disturbances. So some examples of this would be pokeweed and um, uh, Canada goldenrod, frost aster, ragweed, um, so on and so forth. So um, these are plants that we, we shouldn't hate. They're aggressive, but they're native. They're just doing their role in the ecosystem. When you create a huge disturbance, they're trying to patch up that disturbance. And then the last um, step is to evaluate and adjust. And we do this constantly on our projects and home gardeners should do this as well. At the end of the season, take a look at things and, you know, it's okay. And Nancy and I talked about this book this morning. I decided to throw this in. When I was about nine years old, my grandmother, um, I, was, I was a budding young oil painting artist and I was really horrible at it. And my grandma brought me this book called Mistakes Can Be Your Best Friends, where, you know, the idea behind it was that you learn from your mistakes. And um, that's what we need to do with really everything we do in life and gardening is no exception to that as well. Um, if something doesn't work, um, change it, we move forward. You know, giving up is, is really not an option. And the, and the problem with um, some of these, if we, if we, if we were to give up and have our gardens just go to pot, we will probably in many cases never get another chance to do something like that, um, particularly with public gardens and, um, and with our neighbors. So Amanda. Great. Um, these are some things that we would be remiss if we didn't mention when you're working towards this uh, more ecological landscape, which I think is really going to be a critical role that we all have. Um, so we will be the, the trendsetters, hopefully, um, and setting great examples. Um, because I think one of the worst things we could do is if it doesn't, if it, if it uh, rocks the boat too much, it can really set back um, all of the effort. But um, so um, these are sort of givens, but we want to mention them is um, when you're when you are inviting a more ecological approach to your yard you'll need to um, really look at the pesticides and poisons essentially that you put on your yard this could include um, in many cases we're not only looking for pretty plants but we're inviting you know the, the animals and wildlife uh, that need those plants so um, that could go for grubs you know in the lawn um, certainly the mosquito sprays that are becoming more and more popular uh, just the pesticides in general many plants 
plants are actually treated with pesticides before we even put them in the ground. And some of those are from growers that we may not even realize, or sometimes it's secondary growers where they get their plants. These are neonectoids. Um, and so asking questions of our plant people, making sure that we are getting plants that were not pre-treated um, with pesticides, which up until recently was just a given. I mean, it's just sort of assumed that that's what people wanted. Um, so pesticide use needs to uh, needs to halt um, the leaves. So we are also encouraging four seasoned gardens. Again, uh, pollinators tend to be heavily focused on the warm months and the flowers and and that time of, time of year. But um, if we think more broadly about our as uh, our property um, in an ecosystem way, we need to look at all seasons. So this includes the leaf litter. Um, that is a perfect system that nature designed. Um, so there is a lot of life in those leaves and um, provides a lot of nutrients and all kinds of different benefits, um, not just for pollinators, for bees that overwinter, um, you know, in it, maybe the queen bee or something um, underneath leaf litter. There's a lot of a lot of moss that overwinter as pupa in leaf litter. Um, it's just monumentally important. So. There are different ways you can do that depending on your HOA and the rules. Um, but even if you're not trucking it, you know, or, or bagging it and getting it off your lawn, um, there are some other ways you can uh, still keep leaves on property, but maybe also maintain the rules. Um, going back to, or going well to uh, chemicals. So herbicides um, are something that is actually critical for management and it, it makes the job a lot more help, uh, helpful. So um, always obviously follow the label and do as much reading and research as you can um, when herb herbicides are needed. Uh, but one thing that we don't suggest um, is using the homemade herbicides, which in most cases can actually be more damaging um, and longer term damaging to uh, to the ecosystem that they're placed on. So this would be the vinegar solutions and the different like salt and the different things that you see planted. Um, we really need a researched approach to, to that. One question that we're asked a lot is um, if it's okay to use cultivated plants um, or native ours, which are cultivated native plants. And um, <clears throat> generally we don't recommend it. And the reason for that is really because the book is, the jury is still out on that one. So this is a, an, an example of a cultivated native plant. This is actually a, a purple cone flower or was at one point. And we can tell it's a cultivar, not just by looking at it, but also by that, um, the vernacular name of it, the pink double delight. You see it in the single quote marks. That means that it was um, intentionally bred for a specific, usually uh, fe a feature that usually desert to, um, because it has a, a, a characteristic that benefits people and not the pollinators. And not in, in the fact in fact, with this particular plant, I'm not sure that it's even useful to pollinators. I, because yeah, I don't know that anything could pollinate that. So. Right, because it's been uh, modified so much. And the cultivated Essentially plants a, a Frankenstein. So right. The cultivated it. plants are um are typically bred vegetatively instead of sexually by seeds. So they're bred by cuttings instead of um, by, by planting the seed. So what this means is that they are genetically identical. And this is a big concern of mine in the urban tree canopy initiative that's going on across the United States right now. Um, the urban forestry has been really prone in recent years to using a lot of these cultivated trees. Just about every crab apple tree that you'll see on the market is a genetically cloned tree. And why is this dangerous? Well, if you think about genetics, and we're just coming off, of course, of a, of a pandemic where um, some people got obviously very sick and died and other people got almost um, no reaction to it at all. Um, but this is a, a scene in South Bend on Western Avenue, and you can see these trees. This is in the fall. makes them easy to tell. These are thornless honey locust trees, which are kind of the darlings of the urban forestry trade. Um, they do well in urban conditions, and they don't have the thorns, but they're also genetically identical. So in this photograph, 
I counted eight um, that I can see for sure. And if I were to spin around, I would count eight more. So we've got entire city blocks that are being lined with the identical um, genetic tree. And so some studies are now coming out suggesting that we're actually making less sustainable cities because a single pathogen could come in and wipe out this whole block or two. Um, so one of the goals, last slide, I think, right? yeah, this is yeah. our last one. One of the goals, um, overall would be to try to reduce as you reduce your lawn, um, strategically, um, at each year, uh, just trying to get that monoculture of grass out of, um, you know, kind of a little bit less. It takes some maintenance, obviously clipping or cuttings and sometimes watering if you're into that. But, um, so the, the more grass, the more monoculture, um, we can pull out of that system, the better. Um, and so that's a goal. Um, one of the things that we're seeing uh, that's sort of counter to that, or I guess maybe loosely related is the no mow May, um, which we'll probably have to do April any, anymore, but, um, but it doesn't rhyme. But um, use, you know, definitely kind of vet some of these ideas that we see come up. Uh, no mow May was something that both Steve and I initially were just just thinking this is not a good idea. Um, and and we've done quite a bit of research on the uh the campaign and um kind of kind of the behind what what was behind the scenes. And ecologically not mowing for a couple, you know, weeks, um, four weeks or, or yeah. more is not really doing anything. In fact, it may actually be harmful in some ways, both you know, both kind of socially with neighbors and whatnot, but then also wildlife that kind of come into the, uh, an overgrown area. The research that we did actually went a lot deeper and we found out a, a lot of information. And so um, just be wary of of what we buy into and, and do some research and certainly look to experts to help you um, kind of navigate some of those things. Instead of just ceasing to mow, a better strategy is kind of what well this is actually my the front walkway of my house on the left hand side but i've kept there's lawn you can see the lawn still there and we, we maintain the lawn but i put this strip of native plants in there um and it's beautiful and it's full of wonderful insects and that's really one of the 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 main benefits i think that i got from putting these gardens in is you get to go out there in the summertime and you see all of these um, dozens of different pollinating insects that are out there that are you and and the things that are eating them too like spiders and uh, they're all out there and this is now habitat that existed that exists in an area that used to be uh, grass and where there was it was an ecological desert so anyway that's our last slide and we'll put um our um i've got our contact up and our and our websites up we have two different websites and um we will turn things back over to kathy at this point and I'll turn off my screen share um, in a second. If anybody uh, wants to get that email address, you can. And I'm going to stop share. Don't go too far away, uh, Stephen and Amanda. I'm sure people may have some questions for you. And I think Katie is going to scan Facebook to see if we've got any questions there. But we have been um, answering some questions that people had about where they can get native plants locally. And a couple folks from Indy were weighing in, but since we're Northwest Indiana Green Drinks, I'll just give a shout out to the ones that were listed here in the area. Wild Ones uh, sale is great. Uh, you usually do need to pre-order and uh, try to get that order in as soon as they, they open things up. Uh, Dolly Foster is on the call. Uh, her website is Hort, like horticulture, H-O-R-T, the number four, the letter u.weebly.com and she's a great provider of native plants. There is, uh, let's see, we've got a Gary plant sale. I can only find a, a QR code. So if anybody else has a better way of sharing what that's about, uh, please, please tell. Um, let's see. And we have a Friends of Indiana Dunes too, right? That has a, a native yep. plant sale. Katie's nodding. Yes. Okay. So there are a few. Um, we'll hopefully be able to put all of these in the link that I'm kind of building out on nwiregionresilience.org forward slash pollinator dash gardens. I'm trying to kind of curate all of this information there for you to make it easy to find. It's not all there yet, but I, I will do so. Um, there's also information about how you can certify. We've talked a little bit in the past about 
the uh, National Wildlife Federation certification program. It's by no means the only one that's out there. Steve shared it in some of his slides, but I, I really want to encourage people to start there if you haven't yet certified. It's it's you know admittedly a pretty easy um, bar to reach. It doesn't mean it's not valuable. For one thing, it's part partly something that we can do as a collective, which is great. If, if we have time, I'd love for Steve and or Amanda to talk about like, you know, wildlife corridors when we do these things to scale, right? I mean, it, it's great when we have um, them in our own yard, but when we can do them in collaboration with a larger uh, area, that even extends more benefit. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And the subject of wildlife corridors is something that's really important because we have segmented up our landscapes so much, right? And it's one thing to be an animal that can fly, that can move from point to point. But when you, when, if you're something like a box turtle or a terrestrial insect, and you happen to be stuck on this ecological island with nowhere to go, um, it can be... Um, lethal for you to try to say cross the road to get to the, another habitat so it's important that we have some connectivity there and we can do that in a number of different ways even through city planning and things if um if we have uh nowadays we have a lot of the rail to trail um passageways that can be used for wildlife habitat or if there's a river that runs through your city uh, riparian corridor also makes a good connectivity but we have to be have things to connect it to right so we have to we have to have individual citizens that are going to do this as well as government entities really and there's a lot of opportunities for government entities to do this in parks um in libraries, we're working with a library right now. We're working with um, a, a township park, a fire station, as I mentioned. So there's there's a lot of uh, possibilities there, I think, for us to have this connectivity. Thank you for that. And I know that some flyers, uh, let's say the Carner Blue Butterfly, that was you know a butterfly that we really enjoyed having here in our area until you know it it uh, went away. Uh, I know there there's uh, they're not strong flyers, so I think they can't even cross a busy road like a highway is my understanding. So one person planting wild lupin is not really enough. It, it needs not only the wild lupin, but also has some other conditions, I think, with the double breeding season. I don't yeah, know and that's, that's that. a butterfly <laughs> that really we can probably pinpoint its extirpation from the Indiana dunes directly on climate. Um, going back to 2012, we had a, a really strange climate year with a super hot spring and, the, and then a, a massive drought in the summer. And then I'm told also uh, that winter we had a cold spell without any snow. And the combination of those three climate events is really what did them in. Yeah, yeah that's probably a subject for maybe even another podcast where we can <laughs> dive. I'd love to do that. I do see a question in chat and also a correction. Kim Moore from Wild Ones corrected me and said um, that Wild Ones Gibson Woods is not a pre-order. I think it was at some point when I ordered, maybe four years ago it was, but it is no longer. So it's first come, first serve. I take that back. And somebody used the term uh, converting areas of lawn. And there was a question, what does that mean, converting areas of lawn? I, I can say what it meant in my own lawn, which was um, I used a technique called sheet mulching to basically kill off the turf grass and install native plants and, you know, other plants over the top of that. So rather than having a traditional lawn, you know, that's what I did and converted what was lawn before. And I will say, too, one step that I took that I haven't heard mentioned a lot, but I think is really well worth doing I don't have an HOA, but I had a very good friend in Gary who uh, withstood a lot of trials and tribulations about her non-traditional non-lawn and was, uh, you know, fined by the city and, and just had a lot of problems. So in order to avoid that, I proactively almost did a little design charrette with my neighbors. I had a friend who's kind of a good sketch artist um, show the intention of what I wanted to convert my then lawn into being. And I, I put a photo of it up on my uh, Facebook group for my neighborhood and just said, hey, neighbors, this was my COVID project, by the way. I said, you know, here's a here's a picture of kind of the idea I have from uh, my lawn. 
and here's why I want to do it. You know, that, that uh, retention pond that we have problems with flooding all the time. Well, if I do it, it might not really help. Um, you know, you kind of mentioned some things about water. Let's see, what it was it water cleaning? But also with those really long roots of some of these native plants, like going 14, 16 feet deep, right? Don't they kind of percolate mm -hmm. the soil and help with uh, those flash flooding events and flash rain events that we have? Yeah. yeah. So instead of the water sheeting off, I think I've, I've seen studies that say that uh, storm water essentially um, will sheet off of grass only a little bit slower than it will off of asphalt. So the grass is not absorbing anything. So when we think of hard surfaces, we might as well pretty much include lawn in that. But when with native plants and trees and native plants initially, or essentially, you have a lot more filtration um, and absorption back into the groundwater. It's not rushing off, um, you know, everywhere else. So, yeah. So I haven't gotten a lot of takers. I haven't seen anybody completely convert their lawns along with me, but people have said, hey, what is that really pretty sunflower you have? And it was Jerusalem artichokes. You know, and I'm like, okay, that's actually a food plant and, you know, a, a native sunflower and it's a nice, you know, color at the end of uh, fall. And, and I was delighted that uh, the master gardeners here in Porter County, where I live, took notice of my garden and they asked to include it on their garden tour in 2022. And some of my friends who are master gardeners that helped out behind the scenes told me that my garden was, you know, mentioned as one of the favorites. So I, I really love that and appreciate it and want to encourage people if you have such a garden to contact the master gardeners in your area to let them know that you'd like to show your garden and share, you know, as, as kind of a learning garden. Lake County uh, Master Gardeners last year, they actually had, I think it was called a butterfly and bee or, or some kind of name like that, pollinator theme. And, and they had multiple gardens that really demonstrated that rather than just one. So I, I love that this is becoming a thing that we can all kind of get into and do together. And, and one thing I haven't mentioned yet, um, but again, about that NWI region resilience.org website, there are a couple of ways that you think you might just think, well, what does that have to do with gardening or what does that have to do with this project? But, you know, we talk about a lot of ideas here and then people are left with, well, where do I go to meet the people who can help teach me this stuff, you know, bringing it down and grounding me. And so even joining uh, the time bank or coming to a Northwest Indiana permaculture meetup, mm -hmm. probably going to be hosting some pollinator planting sessions. Um, you know, you can learn from people there how to plant on contour, build a bioswale, there might be th some things that you can actually learn to do, or when is the appropriate time to collect native plant seeds? How can you, you know, dry them, um, stratify them if needed? You know, there are just people that have all manner of knowledge that they're willing to share, not for money, but for time credit. So anyway, that, I know we just have a few minutes left and I wanna make sure Nancy has plenty of time or okay. whatever. Kathy, let me add one thing. One of my favorite pieces of advice that I like to give to people is um, always get um, a second opinion from someone who's not profiting from the answer that they give you. Uh, so when we're working and, you know, I, I per personally don't have a hired landscaping crew. Maybe some of us do. I know in my area, I, I tend to talk to groups sometimes who I have to remind myself that these, these gals aren't doing the work, they're hiring the work. But um, uh, but we do work with companies that come through and um, there's just a lot of tactics that uh, we have to be wary of when it comes to nature and still some fear, you know, fear mongering and things. But um, when you're getting advice, um, just definitely try to use uh, folks that don't profit from the answer. And that I think is great. This one benefit of social media and some of the different uh, outlets that we have as we organize and we help. Um, and in our nature, in our Facebook group, we see, you know, that a lot. We really try to help everybody understand that we all started as beginners. And so it's important to treat everyone with these initial questions with grace and understanding and kind of walk them through it because uh, uh, we all started at that point at some at some time. Yeah, that's great, great advice. And while it might not be apparent if you join the time bank, it's not as if time banking is inherently about, you know, green or sustainability or pollinator gardens. But because I helped start the time bank, those are absolutely the people I recruited into the time bank or the people who have those skills. 
So they're people who, as you say, aren't profiting from it. They don't earn a living from it, but they do it as amateurs. And I love the root word of amateur, which is, you know, Latin, um, amo, amas, amat. It's been a long time since I took Latin. It's for the love of it. You know, so they do this thing because they love it. And they're not technically volunteers. They can have it based on reciprocity. So maybe they get a plant or maybe while they're teaching you how to do what they're doing, they could receive another benefit, something like that. I see Nancy's unmuted. So Nancy, I'd love for you to weigh in. Sure. Um, if we could um, take the next um, couple minutes just to um, entertain some of the questions that may have shown up um, in both the um, Facebook comments and also um, here on chat. Katie, are you willing to uh, tell us what we have there? Sure. Uh, we don't have anything over on Facebook, but I did see a couple in Zoom that I wanted to flag. One person mentioned that one of their neighbors was having their lawn sprayed and they were worried about, you know, the drift. Is there, do you have any suggestions on if you see your neighbors doing things that are kind of counterproductive to our efforts? I have that exact issue. Um, and I really like my neighbor, but I mean, really don't like what that what's happening there. So um, I try to just do education as much as I can. And um, I really, in this case, I really kind of go after the sort of fleecing aspect of that, of that service. Um, how much money is getting spent every two weeks to have that done and, and how, um, you know, we can, you work together on on water sources and that that type of thing to really reduce mosquitoes uh the the spread of mosquitoes and then um helping her with other ideas like um a box fan when you're outside some very very simple things you can do to mitigate the annoyance of mosquitoes and um box fan and you know the those packs that you can wear now i mean there's easier ways. So trying to help her even just save money, um, as opposed to if she's not necessarily a nature, you know, a nature not like me, that might be another way to do that. But we've even seen, we've seen people or heard from people that um, have literally had um, lawn care companies show up at their house. I got the, the wrong house <laughs> and right, and we're spraying stuff on their lawn and they went out and started yelling at it. So it's really, uh, I think we we do. It's a tough mindset to change, isn't it? You know, we're, we're coming into the spring months and before too long, the fertilizer companies are going to be flooding the airwaves and the TVs with um, basically the uh, the idea that unless you have a lawn that is lush and doesn't have any weeds, you're not really being a good neighbor. We have to, we have to change I will say that. that. Yeah, I think that... With drift, I think you can, there are some things that you could do um, related to that with the state chemist office. I know of a few people who've actually fought that and um, had damages awarded. I don't have all the details to speak intelligently about it, but you, you, I think you could at least start with the state chemist office and file a complaint if you're, if you are worried about drift. Yes. Yeah, they're required. The, uh, the the chemical applicators are required to follow the label. The label is the law on these products. And so if they're spraying a chemical on a windy day and it's coming into your yard, yes, you can absolutely file a complaint with the Indiana State Chemist. And they could wind up losing their license or being fined. Katie, was there another question? Um, I'm seeing a question now about, do you have any advice on safely getting rid of poison ivy, even though it is native and beneficial, <laughs> maybe not so conducive with the human living? <laughs> any suggestions there? Amanda, That's do you a, want to take that one? Sure, I can try. <laughs> That's a good um, right, you know, uh, right or wrong, wrong, wait, let's see, right plant, wrong place kind of question. I have it growing in my backyard where I don't go. Um, it is an important native species and um it, it doesn't bother any other, you know, anything else except for people. Um, mm -hmm. So probably, although people can be obviously extremely allergic to it, so, um, or reactive to it. And so um, in a flower bed, it would need to be removed. I think the very best and probably safest way to do it would be with an herbicide. Um, and you'd have to do some research about the time. I'm guessing, Steve, you might have a better idea of what time to hit something like that. Yeah, I've never tried. I've always 
taken the uh, attitude of learning to, I guess, live with it. Um, yeah. And, and poison ivy from, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of a shame. It's just, it's, it's, every plant has a defense mechanism of some kind and it's defense poison ivy's defense mechanism just happens to be that it causes uh, a, a terrible dermatitis in most people, but um, we can't really fault it, I guess, too much for that. But um, on the, 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 the brighter side of things with poison ivy, it does, it's very important for birds. It has fruit that ripens during fall migration. You don't usually see the fruit. Um, they're typically up in the tops of the trees. Sometimes it's, it's sometimes just down in the ground or down lower, but, um, it is a valuable food source. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a whole lot of experience yeah. with, uh, with, with removing it, but I have experience with learning to live with it though, I guess. I I've guess got... my point was even with some of the natives that can be weedy, which I think poison ivy wouldn't fall into that, but sometimes there are reasons why we have to control natives. Um, and this is one I, my mom goes to the hospital when she gets into poison ivy. So I can understand um, the issue with it. And um, I think herbicide um, at the right time, in many cases, uh, honeysuckle and some of the invasives too, have certain times that your effort and money and the chemical itself will be the most, the most effective. So researching that and then some, and then treating that um, with an herbicide that is appropriate for poison ivy, which you can find out um, probably more. You'll probably get a lot of people who are going to try to convince you that poison ivy is not all bad. But once you get through that, someone will let you know, uh, you know, what the right chemical is for that, um, especially if you can't avoid the area, you know, and it's in the garden that would be the best way to do that. But there's actually two just issues with poison ivy. Just be sure if you have encountered it or could possibly have encountered it, try to wash everything, including your body, uh, within about 30 minutes of contact. And that should help to decrease the reaction that you have. Okay, um, we're at the point now where um, we'll stop with the questions. And if you do have further questions, please drop them into the chat. And um, Kathy and or Katie will be able to get back with you regarding that. Um, Katie, would you make the couple announcements you have of upcoming events, please? Absolutely. Thanks, Final Nancy. Announcement too. Oh, yeah. Sure, well, Kathy. Kathy, okay. do you want to go first? Go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. I just don't want to forget. Nancy, you asked me to, you know, remind everybody and kind of celebrate that we did achieve that regional certification as the first ever multi-county community from the National Wildlife Federation. So we achieved that just uh, a little while ago. And what that means is we did it, but it doesn't mean that we're done. Again, because of wildlife corridors and because of, you know, the concentration of habitats within a certain uh, smaller area can still be very beneficial. I know there's certain towns and cities or even just neighborhoods that are looking that sort of on their own. So I strongly encourage people to take a look at that uh, community certification program through the National Wildlife Federation. It's a really great program. They provide lots of tools and resources that I talk about more in the link that I've shared a couple times. I'm going to put, put it in the chat one more time. And that is uh, nwiregionresilience.org forward slash pollinator dash gardens. And I first learned about it again here at Green Drinks from Leslie Shad, who I believe is also on the call. So she had helped get um, Evanston, Illinois certified. She was instrumental in helping us do it here in Northwest Indiana. It's not terribly difficult, but um, I would love to be consulted and be a team member if any cities or towns here locally want to do that. Please add me to your team and I can share my notes and help you uh, get a good, healthy start. Thanks so much. Great. I don't know if it's been mentioned already or not either, but um, Save the Dunes does have the pollinator guide, and that's available online um, on the Save the Dunes, um, savedunes.org um, website. So please consult that. A lot of good beginning tips, um, plant choices, and um, how to go about starting your own garden, whether that be in your yard or a much larger um, space like um, Steve and Amanda have been referring to. Katie, we're back to you. Please make your, a couple of announcements you have of upcoming events that I hope people will be interested in and participate with Thanks. us also. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Um, 
And I did drop the link to our pollinator garden landscaping guide in uh, Zoom and Facebook. So please do check it out. It's a beautiful, wonderful resource. But we have two upcoming events that I want to quickly mention. First, um, we have officially got our date together for our annual 5K dune stash. Um, mm -hmm. So that is going to be June 22nd at West Beach. And I am going to put the um the link in the chat and the comments um please register join us we're excited to partner with the national park this year so it's going to be a really great event on june 22nd and then we are also hosting a spring ephemerals bio blitz at the timothy ritchie nature preserve in chesterton on the afternoon of sunday april 28th um, so you can find more information on our um, events page on our website which is savedunes.org events um, so that's that's all i have Thank you so very much. And I'm um, sorry I lost my server for a while, so I went black. So I will have to go back and watch the recording of this event. But again, um, Steve, Amanda, and Kathy, just thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. I'm sure from the hearts of many of our, all of our participants this evening, you're sharing of your vast um, wisdom and experience. Um, and Steve, I love it. You know, you do a mistake to learn from the mistake. And with the mistakes that both you and Amanda shared with us this evening, we're going to be able to be ahead of the curve when we're looking at um, planting natives in our gardens, in our yards, and in our communities. So thank you all so very much. We'll see you next month. We don't have our speaker lined up yet, but we're trying to do something that has to do with be outdoors, whether that be trails or cycling or um, something like that. So you can look forward to that. Be with us again the first Thursday of the month. And that will be on April. Do you have it, Katie? April, what is it? April, 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 April. Help me here. Help me here, somebody. Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. It's April 4th. April 4th, um, 630, same place, either um, Facebook Live on Save the Dunes um, page or um, via Zoom. Thank you all so very much. Um, it's a wrap. And Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Thank you very Bye, much, everybody. everyone. Happy gardening. <laughs>